of the local video piece this uh, kind of kick off in the end of this Good morning. David's going to give me a little. You're good. Hey, I got a thumbs up. Good morning, everyone. I'm Christine Perret, and uh, there will be others joining us shortly. They're either um, at the airport. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> getting coffee or in some other way um, on their way. We have had a number of cancellations. I've tried to keep the agenda up to date to reflect um, missed flights, uh, storms, and other uh, natural disasters <laughs> that cause problems. Um, it's a pleasure to be here once again. Thanks to the OGC for their hospitality and um, uh, giving us the, uh, the opportunity to, to co-locate with the OGC. If you're not familiar, you'll be hearing a lot more about the organization after my presentation in just a few minutes. I thought what I would do is uh, give you a little bit of background about uh, the AR community because as some of you have not been part of this community before and might um, uh, benefit from uh, a little bit of background, a little context, as we say. Um, so we've been working together in a very, very loosely organized way since May of 2009. And it was in the um, spring of 2010 that Damon Hernandez, uh, one of our friends, one of our community members, um, started talking about maybe having augmented reality be um, interoperable and having uh, modular architectures and so forth. And Damon suggested um, as early as the spring of 2010 that there might be a way to do that using standards. What a concept. But and we could also just start from scratch, right? We could start and uh, create new, new standards and um, maybe develop uh, some uh, protocols or codings that may be valuable. And we got together and said, well, let's see what we have in the existing standards pile before we start working on anything new um, and different. And um, a few months later, then in conjunction with this farm, we had our first meeting. Um, there were um, about 50 people, a lot of them some our researchers, but also we started seeing some standards organizations come together. And there was a representative of OGC in the room who said, gosh, you just do it. OGC keeps coming up. So um, that's uh, kind of our, that's the genesis of where we were born and, and how it came about. Um, over the course of, since that time, uh, we have developed this uh, uh, grassroots community further and we seek together to reduce the barriers and to, to have an open and interoperable AR. Um, one of the barriers is understanding what exactly that means, open and interoperable. Um, but uh, I have other, I, I, I think we should embrace the concepts of open and interoperable before we can articulate what exactly that means. And we'll be hearing much more about that. The subjects of how the probability can be designed and functioned. So the community has a web portal um, and some discussion lists where we conduct these meetings and we try to have virtual meetings that have a lot of traction. And again, as I said, we want to reduce these barriers to opening up our whole by collaborating. Uh, so who is collaborating? Well, there's the individuals, um, many individuals from around the world, and uh, uh, later today, we'll have even uh, Rob Manson, who was uh, very active in the early days for Build AR. He's in Australia, and he's going to be coming in. Um, but Blair will be speaking about some of the things that, that Rob is doing. We also have the standards organizations that you can see here in their logos. And in fact, um, these are the ones that I recognize, but you know, it's important to, for you to understand that the ecosystem is even more diverse than those who have taken the time and, uh, to join us in person in these meetings. Um, there are organizations that, some of them are standards bodies, but many of them are industry groups that advocate for the advancement of the other technology or technology for the benefit of humanity. Uh, and, and these together are uh, representing different communities. So, it's an ecosystem. Again, this is one of the things I want to um, drive home there. So within this group, 
we do some very specific things, and that's what Joe will be doing this morning. We've done in the past meetings, which is we, we listen to what the standards organizations are doing. Um, we do that in a consistent way so that we can detect what, if and where there are complementary or, or competitive activities. And then we try to uh, coordinate their activities to reconcile total action conflicts. And, and uh, what I've noticed over the last few years, or at least definitely over the last 12 months, is that now I see the organizations, SDOs themselves, meeting together separately, like at the World Congress, uh, OGC met with um, several other standards organizations that are very active and mobile. And I think that trend of, uh, of, of um, inter community, uh, cross community collaborations is very, very positive and um, that it continues and expands. <coughs> One of our special purposes is to provide inputs to those groups about how, how we can um, increase AR adoption and how we can reduce these barriers and then to try to get needs from our customers and our community members, the developers, uh, to see how uh, we can um, have, have greater growth. Um, I'm not going to read through this. This is all stuff that's on the website. Um, the last of these is uh, an activity we started last summer. The AR browser to try to really test for some of the from our that this afternoon. And this is, that's, a, uh, that's one of many activities that we can point to and say that this would not have happened if we had not um, brought people together face to face and started these discussions and established trust. So, um, welcome to this meeting. Um, you've, uh, I think you've received an agenda and a, and a roster list if you haven't been uh, coming around. Um, our, our goals are to hear those reports that we have in the past, also to hear about emerging opportunities, um, what are people doing with augmented reality, what kinds of barriers are they finding, and um, what are the designers doing, what are, what are developers doing in these days. I'd like you all to feel free to contribute to the discussion. This is not one of those sort of um, monologues. This is a conversation. Uh, if you are tweeting um, or in some way uh, documenting this, that's very good. You can share that with me. Where did you find a suitable hashtag or anything like that? Yeah. AR Community 14? That's a lot of keys. Yeah, I, You're a fast type. I, I'm not going to argue with that. Hey, if you're willing, I'm, I'm, <laughs> if you're willing and able. <laughs> um, so, another thing is, uh, do take action items. Now I'd like to um, actually turn this over to those in the room. I'd like to ask us, uh, before we get and start to hearing more presentations, we're going to go and uh, practice what we preach, which is to become interactive and have the, those of you who are here at this time, introduce yourselves so that the speakers know who's in the room. Uh, Martin, can we start with you, please?
Hi, I'm Kai, and uh, I'm a software engineer with Excelis, and I um, guess we're looking into AR applications with GIS. So. Good morning, I'm Carl Byers with Engrain, Chief Strategy Officer with Engrain. Uh, we are a 3D visualization technology company. A blog series about this topic, innovation in geospatial technology and standards generally, and in particular on mobile location standards uh, in particular, so I've narrowed that down to that topic. Uh, so I always start off uh, with a sense of how important is location, and uh, after search is the most effective predictor of behavior. Knowing where your location is uh, is an extremely effective way to predict the behavior of people. Uh, it's also very important with respect to managing resources, responding to disasters. Um, and so in particular with respect to AR, one of the people that uh, has been regularly involved in this uh, community is Rob Manson from Mob AR out of Australia. And I think Christine said he's going to present remotely a little bit later. Uh, but he has recently put up a, a blog and a, a, a test website about uh, location. His focus being more on the browser, uh, but uh, you know, how much do websites really know about your location? A whole lot. Uh, shouldn't isn't any news to people in this room, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, one of the key things that, from a geospatial standards point of view, is how good, what is the quality of that location information? And so there's this regular statement that uh, is made and has been circulated as kind of a, uh, an internet meme at this point that greater than half of Facebook and Foursquare locations are inaccurate. Um, now inaccurate is a you know, funny word, but in general what it means is it's not fit for the use that it's put to. Um, so in part that's because of how those locations, especially in the media and marketing environment, how those locations are developed and made available. So um, uh, this uh, dirty little secret of LBS ads is from a um, company that uh, helps bring quality to uh, media location, but uh, he, he gives a lot of uh, insight into how companies uh, determine location, and many of them are inferred, uh, which he phrases as made up. Uh, lat long points. So there's a lot of guessing that goes on in terms of location, uh, in particular for marketing and uh, media type uses. So, um, you know, one of our members, Bethany Bose, is really a, a leader in accuracy with respect to location accuracy. And um, uh, the, the fit for use is something that uh, is very key to understand. Uh, is it been developed for your purpose? And has it actually been collected in a way that the quality of information is fit for your use? So you need both standards to be able to share that information in a quality fashion, that is, that the information is shared without um, ambiguity, and it also needs to have a sense of the uncertainty associated with the location. Standards are key to both of those. So um, uh, concurrent with this um, meeting of the AR community, as some of you know, is the OGC um, technical committee meeting that's going on. And we, uh, earlier this week, uh, reconstituted, re-energized, refocused uh, our mass market working group to what we now call the Mobile Location Services Working Group. This is the agenda for the meeting um, uh, earlier this week. Uh, and so you can see the presentations about quality of indoor location. If you uh, have been following what the FCC is doing on that uh, regard, this is, that was a report out on that. Uh, we discussed this new charter of the MLS DWIG, Domain Working Group, Mobile Location Services Domain Working Group. Uh, we had a recap of uh, the OGC workshop that was held at Mobile World Congress uh, at the end of February with uh, a lot of uptake of uh, OGC standards in that Mobile World Congress environment. Uh, and then uh, a discussion of a possible spec uh, that we think is needed uh, for what is called indoor venue maps. 
And so you're going to hear a lot uh, about indoor uh, GML, which is spot on for being able to do navigation indoors. You'll also hear about city GML, at least in what I'm talking, and probably Keith Jr. will probably talk about uh, city GML a little bit as well. As a, okay, uh, so I'll speak, I'll speak about city GML. Very robust modelings of buildings, urban environment, navigation to the point that you can be able to do computer-based indoor navigation, which is much tougher than outdoor navigation. Um, but we also need indoor venue maps, which tend to be a, a simpler uh, visual display, typically not uh, rich enough for computational direction finding, direction making, um, but uh, very much a, a current uh, uh, mass media need for sharing of indoor venue maps and so a discussion about that. Uh, if you haven't heard about what three words, interesting project that uh, it is uh, essentially naming three words for any location on the planet down to a meter or 10 meters squared, something like that. So uh, interesting. He uh, wasn't able to make it, it's been postponed, but uh, we'll address that again. And we will have a summit of uh, this uh, mobile location services uh, activity at the uh, Tokyo Technical Committee of OGC in December with wide uh, uh, invitation. So it gives you a sense of what uh, OGC is doing. Another key part of this uh, mobile location services is reaching out to all of the uh, uh, other uh, organization standards and industry organizations that are working in the space of uh, providing an infrastructure, standards-based infrastructure for mobile location services. So uh, OMA small cell form, GSMA, CTIA, W3C, uh, lots of folks involved with that. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, uh, so uh, this then is a section to talk a little bit about uh, the standards at a, uh, at a general level that OGC provides uh, that are relevant to mobile and AR in particular. And so right off the bat, of course, ARML, and uh, Martin uh, will speak about ARML in uh, good detail and give you a great example and announce again the uh, wonderful interoperability experiment that uh, was organized from Mobile World Congress to show the uh, first open interoperable uh, exchange of AR content. Uh, context, indoor GML, movie features, and POI will all be their own specific topics you'll hear about. Ones that uh, OGC uh, also maintains, but I don't believe there are presentations on KML, uh, which you probably know KML from Google Earth, uh, is now uh, an OGC standard maintained through an OGC uh, standards working group chaired by Google. Uh, GeoPackage, uh, I'll say a little bit, I'll say about a little bit about each of these. Uh, uh, 3D, actually you will hear about 3D, so uh, uh, you'll hear a lot more about that. So, and then sensor things is IoT type stuff. So uh, POI, uh, points of interest standard, uh, began with W3C and now is close to being issued as an OGC standard for points of interest. So a quality of information for POI is a widely accessible spec. Uh, Geo package. And this is a recently adopted standard from OGC for sharing uh, geospatial information, in particular to mobile devices, both tile and vector information in a SQL light encoding format. So very easy to share and very um, uh, accessible to all different kinds of browsers. Every browser does uh, SQL light. Uh, let me skip. <laughs> That is a video that I, uh, it, uh, you'll hear more about uh, some test beds later, so I'm going to skip over that because Christine is going to move. Indoor location, you're going to hear more about that as well. City GML, let me, since we don't think uh, we're going to see a slide like this later in key June, so I'll spend a couple minutes on this. Uh, City GML is a uh, geography markup language for urban environments and has a very robust uh, topographic space model, that is the geometry and the topology for urban environments, including indoor location architectural models. Has a level of detail model, five different levels of detail that you can select for modeling urban and city environments. Uh, and then it's also compatible with the building information model standards, BIM, IFC models, and so it's compatible with that. 
sensor space models is another part of that. So over top of an urban environment, you have the uh, transmitter and footprint of uh, various beacons that are so important for location as part of city GML as well. Uh, good 3D, you'll see that. 3D portrayal, you'll see that. Sensor things, uh, so part of the urban environment is knowing the things and what they measure, all the sensors that are embedded. So not directly related to AR, but I think more and more related to AR, you're going to be able to look around an environment and not only see pre-established content, but get a real-time feed from sensors that are embedded in the environment. And so you need a good open standard for understanding what that sensor is providing, including its units of measure so you can display it, including perhaps sufficient understanding of the measurements so you can do calculations on it and predict something about the environment. So OGC sensor things for IoT. Um, leave you with a, kind of an integrative concept that we have with respect to smart cities. Um, as everyone knows, smart cities is a very big focus right now. What we are uh, building is a, a test bed that relates to urban IoT for smart cities. The key thing to come out of there will be a spatial intelligence architecture for smart cities. Um, seamless integration of everything I've talked about plus some other stuff because it all really focuses on that uh, smart city urban spatial environment that is uh, uh, really uh, the focus of a lot of development. Uh, through our OGC interoperability program, which is uh, a companion to our standards program where we conduct rapid agile prototyping. And is the subject of tomorrow? Tomorrow morning, uh, <laughs> there will be a, um, a report out from our most recent test bed uh, and also some uh, a retrospective, about 15 minutes, you'll get to hear me talk about the history of interoperability program uh, and the 85 initiatives that we've conducted since it began in 1999. That's what I have. Time for questions? Should I ask for questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, welcome, Raj. Uh, time for Uh, morning, everyone. It's a bit loud. Um, so, um, my name is Kolo Wana, I'm a consultant at Ambisha, and um, this presentation uh, has been prepared by one of my colleagues, uh, Roger Brighton. Um, he couldn't make it, uh, so I'm basically uh, presenting this on uh, his behalf. Um, it's a presentation on um, the geo package and the context. 
um, and basically how the two uh, standards address uh, a use case or a, a, a need for uh, shared situational awareness. Um, so the combination of geoparkage and the reverse context and indeed um, other OGC services address the general use case of uh, improving uh, shared situational awareness um, by enabling um, the, your users either in a control room somewhere or others um, el you know, elsewhere, but also um, war fighters or law enforcement uh, out in the street or conducting a patrol you know, in some remote location. It enables them to uh, have access to um, the geospatial data in one way or, uh, or another. And indeed, as well, uh, geospatial capability doesn't necessarily need to be geospatial data itself. Um, so within uh, this general um, use case or uh, scenario, um, Odobus context and geo package uh, fit in uh, extremely uh, well. Before I go on to describe exactly what geo package and Odobus context are, um, I thought I'd basically start off with an explanation of the type of um, requirement or type of needs that uh, they address. Geo package has come about. Uh, as a result of uh, recognition of the need for a uh, storage capability that is server independent, so it can be used offline, um, but uh, offers a single contain uh, container capability that uh, to some extent addresses or ensures the integrity of data at all. Um, the need for an ability to uh, access the uh, data at, at runtime uh, whether it's from multiple applications or from um, uh, or by multiple users, um, but also um, from job package has come about as a result of um, the need or the recognition of, of the need to have um, a storage capability that can also be synchronized with a server elsewhere by, but also being able to be uh, contained in a, in a mobile device or in a constrained computing uh, uh, device. And most importantly, the need for an open standards uh, solution or a standard that um, has wide industry support and also um, uh, governmental and other organizational support. So um, with initial funding and in initial support from the US Army Geospatial Center, um, uh, Geo Package, um, had what was brought to the OGC and um, has gone through a process of standardization and was recently um, uh, made more approved as a, as, as a standard. Um, in terms of what's actually in the job package, at a high level, um, there's uh, some metadata, or in fact, you can uh, add as much metadata as uh, an application may require. Um, there's vector data, um, or the ability to store vector data. Uh, raster uh, tile data, um, but also constraints and that actually uh, maintain the integrity of the data. Just looking at uh, what's actually inside your package, um, as one would expect, the simple features specification is uh, supported. So this is the, uh, uh, or the specification that explains how geometries uh, should be uh, modeled or abstracted. Um, also support, sorry, also uh, supported by Joe package is the ability to store vector data which um, is support, supported using or it's enabled using, uh, as I mentioned, the simple features uh, specification. So you have geometry columns, tables that list the uh, fields that support geometry, um, special reference information as well. Um, and along, on, and that specific capability enables you to store um, vector data that could, for example, abstract um, you know, roads, rivers, poly, um, and other similar uh, you know, uh, geometric uh, types. But also, uh, in addition to, the, to that capability, your package also includes an ability to store tile uh, data. So, and 
I suppose an example of the type of uh, well, an example of a service that offers such uh, uh, resources is a web web tiling service. Whereas the example for sorry for vector data would be a web feature service. Um, and finally, the ability to actually store metadata, so you can uh, embed uh, metadata based on any um, coding within the actual um, uh, job package file. And um, what I should have also highlighted at the very beginning is that it's based on SQLite, which is um, an extremely popular uh, format for embedded databases. It's supported by um, Android, it's supported on Android devices. Um, which basically means that um, a geo package uh, can potentially be run by uh, any Android applica uh, application. And indeed, tomorrow at the OWS 10 uh, demonstration, uh, there will be quite a few examples of that capability. So, moving on from, from geo package, we now move on to the to OWS context. And with OWS context, um, it came about as a rec recognition of the need for. Um, a standard door a format that supports uh, user focused views um, but also views of communities of interest. So we can think of, uh, for example, uh, in terms of user focused views, uh, first responders um, you know, responding to an, an incident, uh, the types of views that they would uh, most likely be interested in, but also views of communities of interest, for example, um, analysts in investigating climate change uh, would be interested in such, uh, uh, such, in such views. Uh, and all series of other um, uh, needs are basically addressed by all the uh, all context. Um, at a high level, what it allows you to store, um, what it allows you to encode is information about an area of interest. Um, information about uh, time ranges and about individual layers. Uh, so the actual resources that are offered by OGC Web Services it enables you to um, basically provide references to them. Um, well, something I should have pointed out uh, from the onset that all of this talk, uh, context effectively provides you with a standard for um, the encoding or configurations of information resources. Um, but you can also include information, such, uh, information about portrayals, so how um, specific types of information should be uh, uh, rendered. Looking at it in, in detail, so moving from the high level uh, view or high level uh, view of that anatomy to, to what's actually inside it, it allows, all of those context um, basically allows you to specify different types of. Uh, of resources, so to provide references to different types of uh, resources. And those resources are, are um, captured um, in, as offerings, or they're described as offerings within all of this context. So what the OGC did was to uh, develop um, a conceptual model that provided the, um, pretty much the high level view of what an all of this context document is, but at the same time they developed an actual Coding. So, Atom feeds uh, are quite popular in, um, in quite a variety of uh, applications. Um, so, that Atom encoding um, effectively uh, has been mapped to the conceptual model. And what that um, allows one to do is to basically specify uh, different uh, offerings uh, of all OGC web services and the resources that uh, they offer. Um, those are referenced by entries within uh, uh, within that, uh, so such atom feeds, and it's um, so basically at uh, you know at a low level that is uh, the type of information that's included within. It. So looking at how the two are to combine, um, you have on one side uh, a geo package file uh, embedded container able to be integrated into a mobile device, and then on the other side you have an AWS context document which enables you to exchange configurations of um, or specifications of uh, different uh, information resources. What that basically means is that uh, one can basically go from uh, discovery of, uh, of resources, um, encoding of what those uh, resources are, to actually packaging the information that's offered by those resources, 
and um, basically taking that package of those information resources and uh, adding it to a mobile device in order to present it in, um, the, in any type of application, whether it's an augmented reality uh, application or, 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 or similar. Have you done any implementations yourself of augmented reality using your package? Uh, we've done implementations of augmented uh, VIC app, uh, well, uh, applications, but um, it wasn't with Ge the Geo package. Um, Geo given that the Geo package is a new uh, standard, uh, that's something that we're looking at doing uh, later on. But what we have done is to implement mobile applications with the Geo package, and that's one of the things that is going to be uh, demonstrated uh, tomorrow. And Mark, Mike will be speaking about this afternoon. Oh, yes. So, um, um, so the actual, so just um, looking at the use case itself, um, so you basically have a user going uh, online onto a portal, uh, running a search, finding some uh, resources that they're interested in, uh, generating an autobus context from those resources, and they are then able to take um, that autobus context uh, context document, uh, pass it to what is being been referred to as a dual package and work processing service. A dual package and work processing service is then able to generate a dual package from those uh, resources. That is the use well, that is uh, the use case that we've been working on on the last time, and uh, it's going to be uh, demonstrated uh, uh, tomorrow. Um, so. A lot has been achieved with both Geo Package. Within a short time as well, a lot, a lot, a lot has been achieved with Geo Package in the reverse context, but obviously there's uh, more that can be done. Uh, so there are a number of um, uh, possible extensions that uh, the community is uh, discussing and exploring. And um, this slide basic, basically uh, lists some of those uh, specific uh, uh, you know, uh, extensions. Um, but it's possible that there may be other um, extensions that are more specific to our augmented reality community and um, um, myself and I'm sure uh, the OGC team would be interested in hearing them. Uh, one more question. Um, when... uh, I'm, I'm on the floor. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yes. So, the reference could be like 
references or artifacts could be dynamic calls to go with that database or go run this piece of code to go generate that artifact, right? Uh, um, yes, I mean, there's a specific standard, for example, a web processing service that is supported by WordPress Mountains that would enable you to uh, process uh, dynamic information. So, for example, if you have multiple sen uh, sensor webs, sorry, if you have sensors in a sensor web that is spread over uh, you know, uh, every region, you will be receiving dynamic uh, data that's being collected by those sensors that will be processed by a WordPress instead that will then be consumed by an OS context that uh, will not consume, uh, <coughs> integrated by an OS So, so then, just a quick follow on that. What's, let's say this framework lives in, you know, web hosted in yeah. Then you can make assumptions about what kind of dynamic data application you can do. What is the assumed context for this framework? Well, it's, I mean, it's intended to be generic. Uh, right. But it should be in a standard. Um, so, it's, I mean, it's not, it's not consumed, uh, so it's not constrained <coughs> by, specific use cases, but the, the three uh, use cases that are uh, that tend to be referenced in the, the phone operating uh, picture uh, use case, uh, so the exchange of phone operating pictures, the uh, exchange of discovery results uh, in an accelerated environment, and also the exchange of uh, analysis results. Uh, but those are those are indicative uh, use cases. Um, what about context itself?
Okay, so my name is Kevin Harden. I'm here for the course today, who is the uh, chair of the OGC Freedom Portrayal, so to speak. Um, yeah, I just want to report on the project status and its current ways. Christine, thank you very much for having a chance to present that to you all today. Now, here actually, I just went through the calendar of the I just read an article on the thing that right was about the elections. That was in Britain, it's the forum to rule them all. Now we're better. Okay, it seems to be quite loud, but fine for you. Okay. Um, yeah. Just wanted to make the link to the three portrayal. Um, well, currently three is not that considered a new package, I think, but it could could be done, for example, in the future in something that is um, yeah at least thought about in the three D um, information management work group in the OGC on three portrayal source group two. Okay, what we're currently doing in a three portrayal um, um, science working group. Um, the idea is to have, um, you know, to tackle into operability in the, in the area of providing 3D portrayal to various clients um, from various servers for various formats. Um, that means to come up at the end with a kind of map server for 3D. For example, in the 2D world, we have the bad map service, we have the bad map target service. And that are widely used and that provide some quite efficient technologies and schemas for making 2D data available. And we're targeting to make that um, true also for 3D. Um, during the last years, uh, several approaches uh, here have been implemented and developed um, for making 3D portrayal, that means uh, yeah, visualizing 3D, 3D data um, through the web, through the internet, uh, for various clients. There, one of two of these approaches are the Web 3D service, um, which is mainly a graphics-based approach to receive graphics data, for example, as a scene graph in a format such as KML from a server, uh, to transfer that to a client that then is responsible for rendering that um, data at the client side. The other one is an image-based approach that we have drafted as the Web View service, which actually means to render already all the data on the server side and then transfer finally rendered images to the client that then um, only needs to display the data and has um, yeah, immediately all the data is available on the server, also available at the client in high quality. Um, coming from that, two drafts that have been developed and have been um, um, you know, released as discussion papers in 2010 already. Now we set up a 3D portrayal into operability experiment that was completed in 2012 um, and came up with some results that have been also um, released and are publicly available as an OGC engineering report um, that you can find at that address. I just want to briefly tell something about that IE as a basis for our work in the Standards Working Group. Um, ten partners from the OGC and also from the F3D consortium um, collaborated um, to identify yeah, technologies and, and ways to uh, make servers and clients interoperable using technologies that are out there already. Um, we tackled the whole pipeline from 3D um, data provisioning, um, including data, data integration into the server system, then using um, their common interface to make the data available, and also using that data at the client side, um, which are of different configurations, including mobile clients and web-based clients. Um, one focus was on making very large data sets available. Um, so when we have geospatial data, we, we speak about 3D city models, for example, that cover 500,000 buildings or so for a large city. And that is complex data set, a lot of objects, a lot of geometry, and if you want to have a textured data, real world textured textures, then that um, you, know, you have a very large data set that cannot be transferred in one, uh, one package to a client, and that we uh, are talking about streaming entirely efficiently. And that is something that was tackled then. 
Now we started with a year a limited set of servers and clients that had some links already and then could establish some new links between the servers and clients that could demonstrate interoperability um, using data for using different data formats, um, including for example um, X3D, KML, um, even transferred CTGML to the client and render it there. Um, and, and use also browser-based approaches based on HTML5 and WebGL using X3DOM to transfer data and display that to clients. Um, these images show some of the results, so we could, for example, um, bring the 30 city model of Paris to, to the clients, and um, could have those on mobile clients, mobile devices, um, which are having iPads and, and tab, uh, smartphones, um, of course, technologies have developed since then. <laughs> okay, so um, that GL actually uh, seems to be developed as a very good platform for providing um, 3D um, on the web and also on browsers. Um, there are some yeah, work is going in that direction. But based on these, um, the results from this IE, um, we um, we. Uh, went for work with developing a common interface that allows us, um, even even if all the servers and client systems and formats are very specific, and, and you, for a specific use case, you need to set up um, a set of um, you need to choose technologies um, that really fit your use case and the data set that you have, the structure of your data. Um, and even the, the configuration of the clients um, at the end, how they should be used, if you want to have some offset usage, or if you have online access bandwidth, is a, is a question for that. Even if you had all these parameters that could, uh, could vary, we really try to have some, some level of interoperability introduced here um, through a um, 3D portrayal service. Um, and the idea of this 3D portrayal service SWIG is to combine the approaches that we have so far to come up with a single um, service interface that allows us to request um, 3D data or 3D portrayal data um, from a server and then make that available for the various clients. This um, service shall combine um, the graphics-based approach, transferring signals, and also the image-based, so a client could decide, um, depending on what the server is offering, which way to go um, to retrieve data. Um, yeah, we were dealing with real-world objects, including not only geometry, but also attributes. So there is a question how to transfer these attributes, including, for example, semantics, uh, thematic information, into the data, into the graphics data, for example. So we need to discuss on that. Um, and we also want to do not want to say which format to use, which, which graphics format, for example, to use to transfer data. We don't want to say that you have to use X3D um, in, in the spec. So we leave this open um, to the server to decide um, which format to offer, um, also offering some, some, some compression, compressed versions, for example, depending on the data um, that, is, that it is providing. So what's the status of the um, status work group so far? Um, we have these major operations listed here, which are get seen, get view, get capabilities, and get feature info, and we are, we are currently ongoing to, uh, to write down what, what we mean, uh, what a common standard should include. So we, are, we have uh, identified um, the, the common concepts from all the standards, um, from both the standards that were there before. So we have the get scene operation that can retrieve the graphics data from the server. Um, the get view operation which tells the server to render a scene and provide an image. The get capability can tell a server, uh, can tell a client um, what the server actually offers. And that is a main major issue for interoperability here. And the get feature if then um, allows the client to retrieve some information about the objects that you see in a scene that was retrieved from a server before. Um, yeah, the GET capabilities um, provides the metadata of the server, including, for example, the information that are listed here. So um, the data layers that are available from the server, uh, which could be, for example, a terrain layer, building layers, uh, city furniture, uh, in the context of the city, uh, city model, for example. Then we are also dealing with um, data uh, yeah, with level or details on, on, the, on the layer level. 
for example, when you have city GML, you have some detailed model or you have some uh, some more uh, coarse model that could be requested to set up a scene, for example, of a single very detailed architecture model and then to, uh, to combine this with more coarse grained context models, for example. Um, which is a little bit different um, actually from computer graphics um, level of detail, right? Um, we have some special selection modes, so you can assemble a scene based on bounding boxes um, and uh, that will include all the data, all the objects that are available there. We can select which LEDs to choose for those. Um, we have a styling, of course, currently a name styling only, so a server says you can request, uh, let's say, the buildings in a textured mode, in a textured appearance, for example, that could be shaded um, also. Um, and that's a way to, to style currently. Then, of course, the server can offer uh, various data formats. You need to tell us in the client about that. We have various um, different you know, special encodings um, advertised by the server. Then some overall styles that mean uh, some additional graphical effects um, applied to a scene and also some meaningful viewpoints that could allow a client that does not know a lot about the data that is offered by the server um, to, yeah, to have a first look at the data and maybe based on the use case to, to take those views that show what is important for the current data set and use case. There are still some open issues. Um, one of those is maybe tiling, that means what, what is the real schema to make a very large data set available for various clients. Um, there are different approaches, we are currently discussing that. Um, and we are also discussing how this feature information, the data about the objects, um, are, are best included into the specification. Well, next steps include that we are discussing this tiling approach in the OGC meeting that is currently ongoing. Um, and we'll try to come up with a draft specification until mid 2014 this year. And hopefully, yeah, hopefully for the Janago meeting, there is an OGC meeting. And then at least one and a half of the September meeting, a draft ready that could be given into the standardization process. Yeah. Um, just the last thing that could be interesting, um, styling, as I said, is very limited uh, currently in the specification. So one of the future steps will be to define how this data should look like. Um, Stalin could allow a client to say, I want to have the data represented, visually represented in a very specific way, uh, depending on attribute data, for example. And that could allow also, um, yesterday in the web the consortium meeting, there was a meeting discussing how portrayal and analysis links together, what does it mean when we have compressed data, and I think this styling could be a very, that could be one point where we could have data filtering and data styling um, brought together and also um, yeah, a link between these technologies. Okay, here. So what does it mean for you? You could use, of course, a battery service or so for accessing, uh, accessing 3D assets from a server and then integrate that in your, in your systems and your ecosystems, right? Okay, you could be in, get involved, of course, if you're an OGC member, come to the meetings. We also plan to have the current specification made publicly. We'll discuss that tomorrow and then we'll let you know you via the uh, model list you have. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, my name is Kijumi. I'm working 
for Indo Dreamer as the chair of the group. So today I will give a very brief uh, introduction of Indo Dreamer since I was given only 10 minutes. Okay, so, so before, so I will skip it. And uh, for the background of Indo you don't have slide. Oh, sorry. I can't see anything. <laughs> ah, okay. The, the, the monitor configuration is... Now you see the... No? Okay, that's good. No, not this one. But I cannot see my screen here. <laughs> okay, sorry. Hmm. <coughs> so oh, I can see my Okay, so I will Yeah, so because I'm mobile. Yeah, I will be my back here. Okay, that's okay. So, like this one. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's written in, in Korean, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, from the first one. Great. Okay. So, that's much better. Okay, so I will give my brief introduction on Indo-GML. So, it is the background of the Indo-GML. That means, as you see, it is a scan capture of Google 3D. So, but you have a lot of PO, the, the, the geotag tag here, for example. So, it is around the Manhattan of New York. So this is a big building of MetLife, something like that, I don't know exactly. But you will find some, some geotag for restaurant, but in fact this restaurant it is not outside of the building, it is inside of the building. So it is almost anything, it, is, it doesn't make any sense because it is a very huge building. So, But if you go to inside of the building, there is almost nothing. So we need some a useful information about not only outside of the building but also inside of the building. So this is the basic uh, start point of the Indo GML. So, so if we have uh, Indo spatial information, we may have a lot of application like uh, Indo robot and Indo LBS and Indo uh, mobile commerce, geo portal and emergency and a lot of application area is possible. Okay, so, but before Indo GML standard working group, there are some prior work like uh, IFC. IFC is a standard made by Building Smart, it is for building information modeling. So, building information modeling it contains, of course, the Indo space as well. And City GML, so Benjamin introduced some brief idea of City GML. So, level of detail 4 it is for interior space. And KML, of course, uh, we may describe some interior space, of course, and some other standards, these are handling uh, indoor space. But, uh, I will give some basic idea of the indoor GML to make a clear difference between the previous work and the indoor GML. So the main idea of indoor GML is the base, based on the notion of space, 